Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Pulitzer Prize winning author David Marinus, and we'll discuss his storied career. Marinus, who grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, won a Pulitzer for his work as a political journalist. He then wrote First in His Class, a best selling and highly praised biography of President Clinton. In 1999, he hit the bestseller list again with When Pride Still Mattered, a biography of Vince Lombardi, and also the source material for the play Lombardi, which ran on Broadway. In all, Marinus is the author of nine critically acclaimed and best selling books. An associate editor at the Washington Post, Marinus was also part of the Post team that won a 2008 Pulitzer for the newspaper's coverage of the Virginia Tech shooting. David Marinus, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kevin. Let's start off with uh, your life growing up in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you wound up in Madison, Wisconsin, and how you wound up where you are now. Well, um, we arrived in Madison when I was eight years old. My dad was a newspaper man. Uh, I have uh, newspapers in my blood. My <laughs> grandfather was a printer in Coney Island, and my dad was a was a editor and reporter. And he was hired by the Capital Times in Madison when I was eight. So I lived there through my uh, high school and college years. Um, a block from Camp Randall Stadium. It was a sort of, I mean, an idyllic childhood in some senses, and the fact that I was constantly able to sneak into every Badger football and basketball game <laughs> when I was a kid, and and lived a few blocks from uh, Vilas Park and the zoo, and uh, uh, went to West High School in Madison, and uh, loved Madison so much that uh, I now have a house back there again. So you spend the summers there. You spend told the me summers there now. Well, yeah. well, Wisconsin is a great place to spend the summers. The winters, I'm winters not too we, sure about. Once we moved out uh, 35 years ago, we rarely came back <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> well, you said you followed in your father's footsteps. Uh, tell us a little yeah. bit about uh, you know your early career as a newspaper person. Well, um, my first assignment, I guess you'd call it, was covering high school football in suburban Madison, you know, sort of the Badger Conference, Middleton and Sun Prairie and that. And my and then I combined covering high school football with covering student demonstrations at the University of Wisconsin. And so those two aspects just coincidentally became sort of the focus of much of my career, uh, you know, politics and sociology on one hand and sports on the other. Um, I... Uh, the Capital Times had a nepotism rule, so I couldn't really work there, um, uh, except for part-time. And uh, my first job outside of Madison was at the Trenton Times in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, it turned out to be, the, in some ways, the luckiest place in the world for a young journalist to be hired because the Washington Post had just bought it, so it was like a farm club. I, I worked in Trenton for two years covering the, the colorful uh, New Jersey world. Um, I remember one day I had five front page stories. Uh, City Hall had burned down. Uh, there was a riot at the state prison and the lieutenant governor had been indicted and the water filtration plant broke so there was no water in all of Trenton, all in one day. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of New Jersey for me. <laughs> and then from there I got to the Washington Post in 1977. Do you remember your first story at the Washington Post? Um, it was a very... Uh, Yes, I do, but it wasn't very interesting. It had, it had something to do with the Prince George's County Symphony running out of money. <laughs> Alas, uh, <laughs> that's sort of a, a story that you can keep writing every year, I think, for, for unfortunately, for music and the arts in this uh, modern world. So you were there about uh, 15 years or so and were assigned to the Clinton campaign. Is that right? And well, what happened was um, after... Um, seven years at the Post, I became the Southwest Bureau Chief down in Austin, Texas. And that jurisdiction, the, the region that I covered included um, all of Texas and Louisiana and parts of northern Mexico and Arkansas. Um, so I got to know Bill Clinton and I was also on the national political team. Um, so uh, it was natural for me to start covering uh, the presidential race, and I picked Clinton early as the one that I would focus on and, and started writing stories about him over the course of 1991 and 92. He was a very young man when he was governor. Uh, well, he, 30s, he, was, right? he was, yes, uh, 
and that he was a very young ex-governor. He was the youngest ex-governor in American history, the second youngest governor behind Harold Stassen ever. And uh, the joke was that he, he fit, when, once he was defeated in 1980 with the Reagan landslide, uh, he fit the uh, definition of a Rhodes Scholar, which he had been, which is a bright young man with a great future behind him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so he was, yes, Clinton was, a f uh, of all the, um, the people that I've written about in my long career, Clinton was, was extraordinarily unique in so many different ways, uh, an exaggeration of all of us in some ways. Did you, I mean, did you know that he was going to be well, I had going a, places? You know, it's easy to say in retrospect, but yes, <laughs> I'll say it. I, I, I sort of, I, you know, I had an, a hunch that he was the one that was going to get there, um, largely because I'd listened to him talk a lot, and I, I, I saw that he had figured out, you know, he'd spent, since he first uh, ran for Congress in 1974, um, he, he, had, he had spent his whole political career trying to figure out how uh, essentially moderate to progressive to liberal politician could survive in a conservative era. And he'd figured out the language of that, um, which is very important in, in national politics. And so when I was listening to him in 1991 in particular, I thought of all the camp possible candidates, he'd sort of figured out how to tap into something. And so I focused on him. Well, he sort of invented uh, triangulation, right, which was picking off sectors of the of the Republican base. Yeah, uh, sort of Reagan, actually. Um, I'm not sure that he invented it, but but the dark side of Clinton invented it. A guy named Dick Morris, who was uh, his uh, Svengali um, advisor, and Clinton believed in it too. I, I shouldn't say that, but but the idea was, and that's part of what I was talking about. I'm figuring out how to talk the language. What you do is you take the issues that the Republicans seem to have the strongest uh, connection to the public at large with, and you co-opt them on those issues. You know whether it's welfare reform or um, or balancing the budget, and then you take the issues that Democrats traditionally have the strongest connection to the public with, like education, uh, and you just hammer away at those. And that was sort of the way he did it. Um, and the triangulation was. Um, sort of somewhere between um, liberal and conservative, you know, somewhere in the middle, playing them both off against each other. Well, the 1992 campaign might in the future be best remembered for when the National Enquirer became a political force in America. Boy, isn't that true? <laughs> I mean, I, I remember, you know, the difference between then and now. I mean, there's still as much... Um, well, getting away from just the National Enquirer and the sex part of it, the whole proliferation of rumor and and gossip and um, misinformation as well uh, is just exponentially increased since 1992. Back in that era, um, I would get faxes from people telling me about something, you know. And now, of course, you get bombarded with email, so it's just it's a completely different world. But but yeah, no, I mean Clinton had to deal with that, and um, it was part of his own past. Um, I've always said about Clinton that. Um, his entire life was a cycle of loss and recovery. Um, whenever he was down, I knew that he would figure his way back up. And whenever he was on top, I'd say, watch out, something's coming. <laughs> you know, it'll be his own self-demise. Um, but but um, completely uh, unstoppable. Um, no matter what's in his way, he'll find his way around it. And that ex he can stop everything except himself. <laughs> that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting way to put it. We wrote a couple of uh, books about uh, his presidency. One of them was uh, more from the Newt Gingrich uh, perspective. Tell which, Newt to shut up. Yeah, a great great title actually. <laughs> which actually, you know who said that? Mm -mm. John Boehner. John Boehner, yes. really? John Boehner. Um, this is uh, in 1995 after the Republicans have taken over and the revolution, quote unquote, is starting. And Gingrich had been mouthing off about various things, and actually Clinton was starting to win the the struggle with the Republicans. And Boehner went back to Cincinnati. We, he was one of the many people that we were interviewing every week. And he said his constituents were telling me, tell Newt to shut up. So that became the title of our book. Um, because they could see that Gingrich, you know, he's sort of an idea guy, brilliant in some sense. Um, but he he he's un, he he doesn't have a governor on his mouth, 
Um, so he'll say things that will, will sort of get the, him and the party into a place they, they can't get out of. Um, and that's where that title came from. And the relationship between Gingrich and Clinton was absolutely fascinating. Because here you had two guys who thought a lot of themselves, who thought that they were smarter than anybody else in the room. And Gingrich, you know, had that sort of ability with Republicans. But he'd get in the room with Clinton, and Clinton would outsmart him every single time. Um, and so it was really the demise of that whole revolution was that relationship. And you wrote another book uh, about the Clinton era, which was uh, which opens up with you sitting in a uh, in an ante room waiting for oh the Clinton the enigma Clinton speech, yeah, yeah which was sort of my attempt to to figure out the contradictions of this incredibly smart um, energetic man with a dark side. I think historians are going to be talking about Bill Clinton for a long time. It might be a hundred years before they actually <laughs> settle in on what it is that they really uh, believe about him. But uh, in addition to politics, and you've, you've written a book about Al Gore, you have a book that will be coming out about Obama uh, in 2012, is that correct? Yes. Uh, but you've also written extensively about sports. Um, you wrote about the Rome Olympics, yep. you've written about uh, Roberto, Roberto Clemente. Clemente. Uh, but of course, here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you know, you know what I'm going to ask you about. <laughs> uh, it's about your Lombardi book. And uh, I guess uh, the question I'd want to know is, what prompted you to write this book about somebody who had been written about so much before? And why do you think that the book that you wrote well, turned out to punch uh, through all of that? You know, I, the, I, I, there probably are subjects that have been written about before that I would say no enough has been said. But I didn't feel that way about Lombardi at all. Um, and um, essentially, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin. Lombardi was a huge figure in my adolescence, as he was for anybody who lived here in that era, who, who cared about football at least, or even about sports and culture. Um, I probably thought that Lombardi was winning for all of us in Wisconsin against the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, you know, that was the beginning of the counterculture era, era. I probably disagreed with Lombardi about many, many things. Um, but I was fascinated by him. Now, I'm not going to write about any other football coach or player. I mean, I might have, uh, it's blasphemous to say it now, but, you know, a few years ago you could have said, well, why don't you write about Brett Favre? It doesn't interest me at all as a subject. What interests me about Lombardi was, um, that he was an icon, that he was uh, mythological, that he, that he sort of was a way to study the, the, um, the whole myth of competition and success in American life and what it means and what it costs, along with the great arc of his story, um, his personal story in the Packers. So that's what attracted me to him. And I, you know, I read um, everything that had been written about him. Um, and saw that there was a lot of room for me to, to go. And so I'm, you know, I, as I'm going to say in my, you know, you know well, I, and, um, I turned to my wife right after the 1996 election and, and uttered the immortal loving words, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? <laughs> <laughs> you must be a, quite a salesman or she must be a very special lady. Both. Uh, no, actually the, the latter. I'm not quite a salesman. But she's, her response was burr. Burr. <laughs> and then we moved up there and had an amazing time. And I, I, I would like to take personal credit for the Packers' last two Super Bowl victories because I moved up in 96 uh, in November. They never lost from the moment we got to Green Bay. They won the Super Bowl that year. Fifteen years later, um, Lombardi, the play based on that book, goes to Broadway. The Packers win the Super Bowl again. So all of you owe it to me. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I believe that the uh, St. Paul Chamber of Commerce would like to uh, invite you to spend the winter in Minnesota. <laughs> um, I think yeah, uh, for a lot of folks who just know Lombardi as you know the iconic giant yeah. statue out right. front of uh, Lambeau Field, what... What did you see in him that made him human, I guess? It's hard, it's oh. hard to even think of him as being human. To, yeah, no, he was things. a very human person. Um, you know, he had, he had a lot of flaws, um, big and small. And, but he had a capacity to take those flaws as a coach and understand how to bring the best out of other people. Uh, for better and worse. I mean, he was, for instance, you know, the whole thing about pain and playing through pain. Uh, Lombardi was a complete wimp. If he had a, tone, a hangnail, he would be out for a week. 
Really? You know, um, but he but he demanded that his players play through that, so he could sort of see his own weakness and try to push it out of other people. Um, he was a great teacher. Um, he had an ability to take any subject and break it down into simplistic parts that were understandable to the slowest person in the room. He was he actually was a teacher at in a high school, a Catholic high school in New Jersey, in Englewood, Saint Cecilia. And he taught complicated subjects, you know, chemistry, physics, Latin. Um, and he was a great teacher. And he could apply that to football as well. So that all of his players said that once they spent an hour with Lombardi as he was diagramming a play or explaining the options of a play, they understood it in a way they never had before, which is remarkable. You know, after he left Green Bay, his quarterback was Sonny Jurgensen in, in uh, Washington for a year. And Jurgensen was a quarterback. He had been coached by two of the great quarterbacks in history, Norm Van Brocklin and Otto Graham. Jurgensen said he didn't understand how to be a quarterback until Lombardi came there, this, this old offensive lineman, and taught him the, the ways to do it. So that was another aspect of Lombardi's um, success. Um, he also was a very emotional guy. Um, you know, I found out that he, for instance, he could be watching a Tom and Jerry cartoon on TV and start laughing so hard he'd start crying. Um, you know, that's not what you think about with Lombardi. No. Um, he was, he was, um, he would often, you know, he had, he, he showed all of his emotions all the time. Um, and um, uh, so there was nothing hidden about him in that sense. Um, he also was, um, uh, he had a deep temper. He knew it. He went to St. Willibrod's here every morning to, to pray about, you know, his anger and his temper. Uh, he couldn't necessarily always control it, um, but he tried to channel, channel it in a way that would bring out the best in his, his players. Uh, his, his central flaw was he had a great capacity to build a family out of his team, but not out of his own nuclear family. And that's really what the play, the, the Broadway play Lombardi has focused on, is that correct? Is that um, To a large degree, it's a, it's a personal story about uh, his relationship with his wife Marie, and with his players as well, but yes, it shows the the uh, that tension of this demand for perfection and greatness, and yet the the inadequacies or the the contradictions of it at home. Well, Judith Light, who plays his wife Marie in in the play, uh, recently was nominated for a Tony Award. Judith Light is fabulous. I mean, I I love her as a person and as an actress, and I think that um, yeah, she and. Um, by the way, Susan Lombardi came to the opening night in, in New York, and she went up to Judith afterwards and said, you are my mother. Really? So that was quite a compliment. I think Judith is probably more lovable than Marie was, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, she, she's an incredible actress. Well, what was it like? I mean, I don't know if this was your first uh, Broadway uh, experience, it, but what was it like to see your, your baby turn into... Uh, uh, something quite different, really. It was thrilling. Um, and uh, I've often said, it, I, I'm a grandfather, I have three little granddaughters. The, the play was like having another grandchild, because um, it's all joy. I'm not responsible for it, but it couldn't exist without me. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but it just turned out that this play in particular, um, uh, you know, I mean, the Critics and other people look at it in one sense. When you're in, internally involved in a play, you see it in another way. And what I saw was an incredibly um, uh, strong, tight community of actors and, and, and director and everything. It was really a wonderful experience. There was no dysfunction at all, even though part of the play is about dysfunction in a way. Um, because Dan Laurie and Judith Light are actors' actors, um, they're, they're very committed to it. They both told me there was never a single day, you know, 244 shows where they didn't want to go on stage. They loved it. The four younger guys in the play all loved being with them. Um, Tommy Kale, the director, 34-year-old boy genius who you're going to hear about for the next 30 years um, in Broadway and Hollywood, um, brought a great sensibility to it. Eric Simonson, the playwright, is a friend of mine, from went to Lawrence College from Wisconsin. There's just this nice cohesive unit that really made it a, a very uh, a warm ex and wonderful experience for all of us. 
You're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College, and joining us is Pulitzer Prize winning author David Marinus. We've been talking about Lombardi and the play, um, but you have another project uh, in the works. Uh, your book about Vietnam in the 1960s, uh, I understand, is going to be made into a Hollywood movie. Is that oh, right? I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> well, my, <laughs> my joke is that all of my books are in various stages of not being made into movies. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's why the play was so wonderful. It really happened. But yes, no, um, the Vietnam book. My book on Rome, there's a possibility of a movie built around part of that, Wilma Rudolph and the Tennessee State Tiger Bells, which I think is a fabulous story, and Clemente. Um, but but what, ha what has happened with the uh, Vietnam book, which I'm incredibly delighted about, is they turned it into a modern dance. Um, a great choreographer in... Uh, a modern dance. A modern <laughs> dance in New York, Robin Becker, um, who I had known somewhat... Um, said she loved the book and wanted to make it inspired her to do it. She's a she's a dance professor at Hofstra as well as has her own company, and she spent three years working on a choreography about this book, and it was performed at the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, in March and at Hofstra in April, and it will keep going. And it, it it's um, you know it it's of course not literal because it's modern dance, but. But, you know, my books have been translated into many different languages, Chinese, Polish, Italian, French. But this first time it was translated into modern dance. <laughs> that's, that's and it was really fun. So, now, so, you know, it might become a movie someday, but we'll see. Well, if, it, if it's, on, <laughs> it's on IMDb, so well, it yeah, must be true. Yeah, right. You know the percentage <laughs> of, of those that actually become movies? <laughs> it's not a high percentage. <laughs> no, but it, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I would love to say, yes, you're right, but I have to be honest about it. We'll see. Well, um, the thing that I find uh, interesting about that is you must have been about 18 or 20 years old uh, during the summer of love, right? The, the 67. Oh, I was, I, I just graduated from high school, and the book takes place in the fall of 1967, yes, and I was a freshman at Wisconsin. Now, half the the book is about a demonstration at Wisconsin against the Dow Chemical Company, which was the, the makers of Napalm and Agent Orange, um, and there was a sit-down um, act of civil disobedience in the Commerce Building at on the Madison campus. Madison police came in and it turned into a, a riot, basically, a police riot, one might say. Uh, at the same time, there was a battle in Vietnam where a, a battalion of men walked into the jungle on what they called a search and destroy mission and they got ambushed and destroyed. And what I do in the book is juxtapose these two incredibly different worlds that were about the same thing, the war in Vietnam, with jo President Johnson and the his administration is the hinge between these two different worlds. Um, you know, there's great literature about the war in Vietnam itself, less literature about the anti-war movement. I hadn't seen a book that put together into one interwoven narrative these two um, worlds, um, and that's what my book does and what a movie, if it ever gets made, would do. <laughs> I can only imagine what an interpretive <laughs> dance of that must, must look like. Well, are they likely to do an interpretive dance of your Rome book? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were some beautiful characters in the Rome book. It's um, about the 1960 Olympics, yes, right? Yes, the 1960 Olympics, which attracted me um, in some of the same ways that Lombardi did, that you could use the drama of sports to write about history, really. Um, 1960 was uh, in Rome was a a hinge point in so many different ways. These were the first televised Olympics. Uh, the first drug scandal occurred in these Olympics when a Danish cyclist died during a road race. Um, it was the, um, right in the, the sort of early era of civil rights when the American team was led by African Americans, Wilma Rudolph, the great sprinter, and Rafer Johnson, the best athlete in the world who won the decathlon. Rafer was chosen to carry the American flag, the first time a black had done that for America. Um, Africa was was emerging then, uh, independent Africa. Fourteen new nations got their freedom that summer. Um, the first black African ever won a gold medal, and it was Abebe Bekila of, of Ethiopia, who ran barefoot through the streets of Rome to win the marathon. Um, the East and West Germany competed as one team right before the Berlin Wall went up. It was the heat of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the U.S. There were spies teaming in Rome um, looking for defections. Everything okay. sort of in the modern world was coming into view right at that moment. 
Wow. And, you know. Uh, and Cassius Clay was there. Cassius Clay was there. Ali. So you got some of that. Cheering too. on the Sunday right there. <laughs> I also understand that's the first one where uh, computers were used extensively. Uh, and uh, Tech Schramm, who was the Cowboys uh, general manager or president, uh, watched how IBM used computers <laughs> to analyze it and started to take. Uh, that and apply it to player evaluation in <laughs> in the uh, Coach Brown kind of uh-huh. fashion, and of course we know the Cowboys uh, were the second best team during the 1960s. Yes, <laughs> I would I would emphasize that. <laughs> um, well, you're writing a book about Obama yeah. right now, yeah. right? And uh, you said uh, earlier uh, to me that uh, you had been doing some research in Kenya about. about yeah, that. we went to Kenya for several weeks. Uh, fascinating experience. Um, you know, his father, Barack Obama, the, the original Barack Obama, um, really was not a part of his life, but of course he wouldn't exist without him. And my book is about the world that created um, our president and then how he recreated himself. So the whole story of the Obamas in Kenya, um, you know, there's a lot of mythology about um, the Muslim background of, of Obama and so on. And the, you know, just to give one little thing away, which might be apparent but might not be, every step along the way of the rise of the Obamas in Kenya, it was conservative Christian missionaries who made it possible. <laughs> really? And so, you know, the, it's just so, there's so much bogus stuff out there and, and you know, sort of unwittingly, unknowing um, the stuff about Obama and about history. I mean, when you when you delve into the real history of things, you always find it so much more interesting than the mythology. How do you go about researching a person like that who seems to have uh, very small footprints for a president? I mean, most presidents in American history, maybe because the biographers like you went after it, but seem to have left traces, big traces, wherever they went. Well, there, Obama, there, are only, so there are only a few holes in the Obama story, and they've, they've been a little frustrating to try to fill. I mean, I had no problems in Kenya, no problems in Indonesia, no problems in Hawaii. Uh, there are a couple of holes. Columbia, when he was he, he was at Columbia University for two years after he transferred from Occidental um, in Los Angeles to New York um, in 1982 and 83. And those years are, you know, the, he didn't leave a footprint there. It's really fascinating what he was doing in that period. Um, but there are ways. I mean, you, if you just are persistent and patient, and keep keep going back, you know, you find stuff. Um, uh, so there's there's plenty of material, believe me. <laughs> well, and the, and the and some of the so-called missing parts of his life are not missing at all. It's just people are fabricating stuff. Well, with the internet now, it, it not a very high hurdle to uh, to post an expose of some sort. Boy, uh, is that ever true? I mean, it's amazing what's out there that's bogus. You know, one of the things that uh, amazes me about the internet era is uh, when I go online and read newspaper articles. In some ways, the most entertaining and most depressing part of that are the comments that come after that. Yes. Like, where do these people come from? <laughs> I mean, well, are it's, they hiding in the corners and they just it's it's, it's Jungian or Freudian or something. But but these same people, if you confronted them face to face, would be different. But in the you know in the and protection of anonymity, some something sort of almost animalistic comes out of people, and that's what comes into the comments of any newspaper. I mean, any reporter has has dealt with the incredible venom and and um, just sort of uh, unbelievably unthinking comments that people will make uh, if they're anonymous. I hope you've enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.